Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and today we have David Sherman. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Trey. I'm really excited to have you on, David, because you've had a long career primarily investing in high-yield corporate debt, which is something we've really never talked about on this show. Um, we just had Howard Marks on the show. He's obviously had a long career in the, in the, in the space, but we didn't go into much detail as to how to do it or why to do it. And in this environment or this economy, I think everyone is looking for alternative assets of some kind. And this is a particularly interesting one. So I'm kind of cu just curious to start things off, learning more about what even motivated you to specialize in investing in things like high yield corporate debt. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be part of a group of uh, terrific investors such as uh, Mr. Marks. So. Uh, my, my road to high yield is quite simple. Uh, I went to Washington University in St. Louis. I saw this ad up my freshman year that said Dean Witter, cold calling. I didn't know what the dean he was of what department or school. I didn't know what cold calling was, but it paid a whole bunch of money per hour. And I found out very quickly it was Dean Witter Reynolds and it was a brokerage company. And I decided I would only cold call if I could become a registered stockbroker while I was going to school. And this is back in 1983. And in 1983, interest rates were coming down very quickly and people were seeking yield. And it was the, the, the real beginning of high yield debt or junk bonds taking root uh, per Michael Milken. And Dean Witter had a product called High Income Trust Certificates. They were gonna buy a portfolio of high yield bonds that produced a lot of yield. The, the thesis was some are gonna lose a lot of money but on an aggregate basis, the net return would be very attractive. And of course, I was very attracted to the yield. My clients, it was an easy sell. They wanted, they wanted more yield. But it seemed kind of stupid to me to do a static high yield portfolio knowing you were going to have losses. And just like an insurance company has to predict future losses in a property casualty company, for instance, of incurred but not reported, you knew this was going to happen. And the question was, how do you get rid of or how do you minimize the risk of incurred but not reported losses? As a result of doing work and networking, I was fortunate enough to be offered an internship at Drexel Burnham in LA, working on Milken's trading desk. Um, and that obviously by definition threw a young college student right into the heart of high yield, right as 1985 and 1986. It was, it was the beginning and it was super exciting. I mean, it'd be like being in the forefront of the crypto investing today. And I got lucky. Good space, very well, great mentors, uh, great opportunity. Uh, came back to St. Louis during the school years and rated the investment banking client list and saw that one of the clients was an insurance company owned by a company called Lucadia National. And I decided that they were able to get me an internship as an analyst, junk bond analyst. Again, more being focused on junk. Uh, I ended up joining them full time my senior year in college. Uh, Locati has a great reputation among value investors, uh, and that was a great place to learn under Joe Steinberg and Ian Cumming. I stayed there for 10 years, uh, left as a senior executive, and there I got the experience of not only managing junk bonds and looking into junk bonds, but looking at distressed junk bonds, looking at stressed junk bonds, looking at deals and transactions that are actually investments, uh, taking insurance company assets and understanding asset liability management, investment grade asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, and interesting things we don't even talk about today, like dual securities where they paid your principal in US dollars and the coupons were in Swiss francs. And I was got to be exposed to all this, and I was the treasurer of those insurance operations as my line responsibility. Even going out to Russia early days in 94 with vouchers. So it was a great place to learn, and I was fortunate that I put education and learning over making money. I did perfectly well at Lucadia, but I could have gone on Wall Street, you know, had a very narrow vision and not expanded it. But I stayed with high yield because if you look at high yield, whether it's distressed or stressed or high yield, the entire area is intellectually interesting and it's not well followed. So just like a good value investor, there it was less crowded in those days. You could find better opportunity if you were good at getting information um, by digging and also doing research. Um, and if you look at the general high yield market, historically, over 10-year periods of time, 
the high yield market has produced quite similar returns to the equity market, slightly less, but quite similar, with significantly less volatility. So it's sort of a hybrid uh, equity, which would explain why firms like Oak Tree were very attractive because it gives you a very good risk volatility or risk return analysis or a better sharp ratio. So I just sort of got lucky and I'm a curious person and it piqued my curiosity. Well, you touched on mitigating the risk. I'm really curious about that. You're, you're walking into a company that's distressed, as you mentioned, and they're putting up this high yield because there's a lot of risk involved. And so what do you typically do to mitigate the risk? And do you see any sort of activism involved in this space at all, where it's like, okay, we're going to invest in this. They're in a tough spot, but we know we're going to turn it around. And just talk us through the diligence around that. So I, in that question, I think you need to break down high yield from the stress and distress market. So think of the stress and distress market as a credit opportunity. And think of high yield as money good paper or paper you believe will be money good, where you're clipping coupons and you're clipping returns significantly higher than the investment grade world or other fixed income. So in the high yield world, quite frankly, and financial analysis is the key to mitigating risk. Um, today, you could overlay and put hedges on using CDS, uh, CDX, uh, these are derivatives on the index or specific credits or specific companies. You could even just as simple as buy puts on HYG, the ETF, or short HYG or JNK. Um, the ETF world has been great at segmenting asset classes to allow you to have access to these things. But then you're hedging away broad-based market risk. A lot of people can't do that. It takes a lot of capital. And then you're getting a lesser return. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the best way to mitigate risk is to focus on protecting your principal first, which means you have to be a bottom up uh, high yield investor. Unlike investment grade or treasuries, where you're making big macro decisions of is the Fed this week in Jackson Hole? I know this is going to podcast in the future, but are they going to raise rates? And where's the short rate going to go? And what's the curve going to look like? In high yield, you're getting most of your return by picking the right credits, right? So it's much more akin to being an equity analyst. And the good news is, unlike equity, where you, have, you, you can easily lose all your money because you're at the bottom of the capital structure, here you have some protection so that if your analysis is off or management fails to execute, you have some cushion. It may not be enough, but you have some cushion. And in return, you're giving up unlimited upside, obviously. Um, but you are at the, 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 you are top in the capital structure, depending on where you are. So a high yield investor, it's really about understanding the business model and also doing the analysis. And I think business model is really important. Now, companies either become distressed that were investment grade or they're high yield and they become distressed. So the best case scenario to find a stressed or distressed investment, if you're a value investor, is to find a company with a great business that has a bad balance sheet, right? So examples in the past is, for instance, RJR Nabisco that was leveraged buy out by KKR. This is one of the oldest, greatest ones that people talk about. Just too much debt, great business, too much debt. So, you know, the question was, how do you compromise or mitigate the capital structure, the debt structure, um, and who are the beneficiaries and where do you want to participate? And we can talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so a distressed investor really, really is an equity investor that uses the bankruptcy laws to help determine the rules of engagement. Some people focus strictly on making money by taking advantage of those rules of engagement. There's a hedge fund called Aurelius that's extremely good at this. Um, lately, you've read a lot of articles about hedge funds uh, being on the steering committee or the inside committee to cut a better deal for themselves by putting up new money to help the company come out of bankruptcy to the detriment of other bondholders that they're equal with in, in class. But in general, there's still rules. So you have to really understand and master those rules. No different than if you're a congressman, you should master Robert's rules of order. And then you have to do basic analysis. And again, a bad business, you can't save. You know, um, I don't particularly like the steel industry not because there's anything wrong with it, but it's got capital intensive, commodity driven product, 
with generally a lot of leverage, right? Those aren't really good business models. And if you're going to do it, you want to buy it when it's a cheap stock going into its cyclical upswing. But to be a lender, not so great. So another example would be nursing homes, right? Again, high operating costs, big expenses building it. You know, you have the government, meaning Medicare and Medicaid, basically leading the price saying of what you get paid for reimbursements. And if you do an excellent job, best of care, they reward you by capitating your pricing. So I think understanding a business model sort of is important. Now, as a distressed investor, taking that nursing home example, you know, if you can buy a nursing home at $20,000 a bed, you're going to make money, right? You're buying it at a cheap enough price if it's a well-run nursing home. So I think there's two different parts. So I don't think it's a coincidence that distressed investors or distressed firms became private equity firms in their evolution. So you can think of firms. So Oak Tree was a good example of that. Cerberus is a good example of that. Apollo is a good example of that. Um, they were all originally stressed, distressed investors or had a stressed and distressed background. Awesome. Walk us through a little bit about how corporate debt is actually priced. I know there's all kinds of acronyms out there when it gets into this category, like LIBOR, L-I-B-O-R, et cetera. Walk us through the interest on top of LIBOR, how things are priced, and then how they perform over time. So look, I know you have a pretty sophisticated audience that's very well healed in financial terms and financial concepts, but I want to take us back to the basics for a second. So if you think about a company, right, there's basically two forms of capital that they use to grow and build their business. One is they raise equity money. I don't care if it's venture capital money, stock money from an IPO, it's equity money. You get the economic spoils, you get the economic failures, your bottom of the structure, that's how you participate. And then there's, they borrow money. No different than if you have a house, you borrow money in a mortgage, and then you are the lender. You, you, you are the equity. And maybe in between, you get a home equity loan. So that would distinguish two different lenders, a mortgage lender, an unsecured home equity lender, and then you're still the equity. So debt is top of the capital structure. And then within debt, there's different tiers of who's more senior than the other and who has first dibs on the business or the assets in a distressed situation. But in a non-distressed situation, in a company that grows and flourishes, and you don't need to have first dibs, you don't need to worry as much about ranking because it's doing well, you're just a source of capital. So that's an important part. Within the debt structure, corporate debt, um, you know, there are all kinds of things. There are private loans that banks do every day to public and private companies. They issue working capital loans um, secured by receivables and inventory. As the world evolved, they now syndicate or offer those out to other lenders. They can be offered in structured products like collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, or collateralized debt obligations like CDOs. In CDOs, they not only buy loans, they buy bonds. Um, and then you have I have a mortgage where I have a first lien on all the equity of your subsidiaries. Then you have, I have a lien on property, plant, and equipment. Those are all versions of secured debt in various ways. And you can have a first lien and a second lien where the people with the first, by definition, get a interest in the beginning. And the people in the second get the residual value of the collateral. And then you have unsecured debt. This is just debt they owe you. There's nothing backing it. So in people automatically assume if you have a secured debt, it's always fine. But that's not true. Just like a house, as we know from 2008, you could have a secured loan and find out that you lose money because you owe more, the homeowner owes more money than the value of the house. It's upside down. Happens just like that in corporate America. Happens like that in asset-backed securities. Happens like that in mortgage-backed securities. But there's unsecured loans. Then there is what we call mezzanine financing. This is Way down at the bottom capital structure, there's usually a lot of debt. It's usually in uh, growth equity stories or private equity, meaning LBOs. Um, and they are looking to get 
equity type returns in a lender's position where they're senior to the equity. Then you have preferred stock, which may be perpetual and not have to pay you dividends. So it's, it's sort of the worst of all worlds. You don't get any of the economic spoils and you're stuck. You're what I call a stucky. You're the new stucky. Um, or you could have a preferred stock that has real teeth. You can get board control. They have a maturity. And then you have equity. So I think it's important to think about all of those aspects uh, when you think about the debt structure. And when you analyze a company, I think the easiest thing to do is figure out what you think the company is worth as a total company, unlevered. Right, everything looks good with leverage. Whether you're an equity investor or you're a lender, what is the company worth outright before we do financial engineering? Now, what are my risks to the downside? What are my risks to the upside? How much of those risks are macro and exogenous that are really out of your control? Right? Cruise lines were thought of as a great business until COVID showed up. That's an exogenous risk, an outside risk people may not have thought about or perceived. And some people may have had the vision to think it's got pandemic risk. And then there's the business risk, your competitors, the industry, is it changing? You know, if you were a company that made thermal paper for fax machines, not such a great business today. Um, and then there is the execution risk. Can this management team lead it? So going back to my steel example, you can have the brightest, best, management team in the world, but you still have a steel company, right? So there's only so much they can do. By the way, management is important, but in equity, people really look at who the leader of the team is, right? They really say, who is running the company? I'm, I'm, I'm investing in, and putting a heavy weight on that person. I try to use the word bet because I think there's a big difference between betting and investing. Um, in bonds, you just want to know you're going to get your money back. Right? You just want a competent team that's not going to mess it up. There's a big difference. So you can now start seeing the distinguishment between how an equity investor might think and a bondholder might think. Okay. So those are important points. Um, and that also doesn't change the fact that equity investors might find hidden assets. Well, they're also hidden assets for bondholders. If those assets are realized, the rating, the credit rating of a bond may improve. Right, so I'll go over that in a second. If you're an equity investor, you get the economics of that value, so you get a higher upside. But bonds tend to be rated, and the rating agencies, Moody's and S&P are the leaders, do a really good job when they're issued of rating. Triple A, double A, single A, triple B. That's an order of ranking from best to worst. That's all investment grade. Now, high yield starts at double B, single B, triple C, and then, of course, our famous default. So if you can find a company that got downgraded from investment grade to high yield and then is going to work their way to become investment grade again, you can make a lot of money because the spread between what you're being paid in the treasury is wider or bigger or more yield or fatter when it's lower credit quality. When it's higher quality, it's narrower. So a company that was originally trading 10-year bond, trading at 90 to 120 basis points, that's 0.9 to 1.2% more than a 10-year treasury, right, might be investment grade. It got downgraded. All of a sudden, it's trading, it's a double B, triple B, so it's split rated. All of a sudden, it's now trading at 225 basis points off the same treasury. That's 2.25% more cushion, more margin, getting paid more for your risk. Now they continue to deteriorate and they go down to single B. And now they're yielding 4% or 400 basis points more, five, 500 basis points more. And by the way, these spreads change both with interest rates and with business cycles and with market cycles. Um, right now they're very tight. Interest rates are also very low. But the point is that company that's a single B, if the management team gets replaced and a new team comes in and they say, we're committed to becoming investment grade again. Well, if you have a 10-year bond, you have what they call a duration. And again, I'm picking things to help give you terms. So duration is a concept that for every 100 basis points or 1%, the niche rates go up or down. The, the price movement will be in the inverse. So if interest rates go up 1%, 100 basis points, and it's a 10-year bond, the 
the, the, the bond will lose eight to 10 bond points, right? So a zero coupon bond, somebody doesn't pay cash, always it's duration, it's maturity. The reason the duration shortens when there's a coupon, what you get paid every month or quarter or semi-annually or annually is because it's a present value calculation. You're getting money today, which affects the, the, the value, right? Because you'd rather have money today than in the future. But in that case, in my example, a company issued a 10-year bond, it instantly gets downgraded from single A to single B, right? It immediately goes from 100 basis point spread over treasury. Again, this is extreme, but it's for illustrative purposes, to 500 basis points over treasury. That's a 400 basis point change on a 10-year bond. Well, 10 times four is 40. So you're gonna lose 30 to 40 points in bond price. Bonds are priced, you know, 100 is par. That's 100% of principal. 100 means you get, it's worth 100% of its face amount or principal. So you're going to lose 30%. Okay. Now the company is committed to becoming investment grade. The new guy realizes it's a good company. He's going to make the same 40%. So ratings and where they are in a pecking order and improving or not is one way to make total return. It's not the only way. In fact, it's a, it's a work part of a way. But I'm trying to explain bond concepts in a very quick format for your investors to think about. And then of course, a big difference between investment grade bonds and high yield bonds, for instance, is investment grade bonds generally are not callable, meaning the company doesn't have the right to refinance them like you do with your mortgage before, maybe six months before maturity, but not sooner. So if you took out a 30 year mortgage, you can refinance it whenever rates go down. But if a company takes out a 30 year bond that's investment grade, most investment grade bonds don't allow them to refinance it in the near future. In high yield, it works differently. In high yield, there's no such thing as a 30-year high yield bond that wasn't downgraded. But let's take a, a five-year high yield bond or a seven-year high yield bond. They might not have the ability to refinance for two years, but then after two years, they have the ability to refinance at various prices, maybe initially at two or 3% over phase, 102, 103. And maybe it drops down every year by a point till it gets to par. So just like a mortgage with prepayment speeds that affects your maturity or your average life or your duration, which is called convexity, you have the same issue much more so in high yield than you do in investment grade. So those are, again, other nuances. So as you start going through the bond market, there are things that you have to become familiar with. And touching on a couple, of, a couple more nuances, uh, specifically around duration, since you touched on it, can you describe the difference between short duration and low duration? Oh, okay. So uh, we have two products. Um, excuse me, I forgot. We have two strategies. FINRA doesn't like it if I talk about products specifically. So for marketing purposes, compliance comes down with me. If I name products, because then it's marketing. So I'll talk about strategies. I apologize. We have two strategies of which uh, one of them is a a short-term high yield bond strategy, which by the way, as a product would be misnamed and we should have called it an ultra short-term high yield bond product. Um, and what we mean by that when we are talking about our own individual strategies is a short-term security. And generally in the investment world is deemed as something that has a maturity of one year or less or a duration of one year or less can have a longer actual maturity because your maturity can be different than your duration. Um, so we think of short-term bonds as anyone who wants to put money to work for six months to a year and a quarter, like that one year segment. I mean, if you, it's not a great asset class to invest in if your kid's going to college in September and it's June and you need to make tuition because you could have prices go up but you get a prices go down and what you thought was a guaranteed tuition payment all of a sudden has a loss. You should just go put it in the money market, put it in a checking account, buy a three month CD, right? You shouldn't take price risk with it. But if you say, what about year next year when they're a sophomore, perfect product for that because the implication is over a 12 month period of time, you'll have all your principal back plus a return. What we mean by low duration strategy, and we have a low duration high yield strategy, is we mean more than one year, but less than three years. So that would cover your junior and senior year of college. 
And in return for allowing us to take a longer horizon in investing, we should get paid more returns, just like the equity market. Most equity investors, they took a five or 10 year perspective and didn't look at their portfolio unless they thought they made an egregious mistake, would do better than people that focus on what did the market do in the last three months in this name? Not always, but generally that's the concept. So in our particular parlay with our products and our strategies, not everybody has the same exact definition. Uh, short term uh, generally means one year or less, low duration implies more than a year, less than three years. We actually focus on nine months to about a year and a half um, in our low duration. So we're even lower than most low durations. But in the invest world, short-term securities almost always refer to things that will be one year or less from a balance sheet perspective. This might be a marketing vernacular as well, but you have another strategy called the Responsible Credit Fund. And I love that name. It somewhat seems uh, redundant a little bit, maybe, <laughs> as far as, uh, you know, we want it to be responsible because I'm it, the question comes to mind, what is the alternative of that? But I'm curious, what walk us through what is implied with the responsible credit fund? So in our re responsible credit strategy, just want to correct you because I don't want to go to FINRA jail. Um, <laughs> in the responsible credit strategy, uh, the implication is that we're going to be ESG mindful. ESG meaning environmental, social, and governance mindful. Um, obviously, uh, the question is, why did we pick that? Is it because it's a current trend? Is it a marketing ploy? Is it greenwashing? Um, I can answer all those questions. The answer is no to that. Um, but the reason we called it responsible is because we want to take a responsible approach to ESG. And we want to have mindfulness to embrace the purpose of ESG. But we we recognize that today there is no standardization in the equity market and certainly not in the bond market of what is ESG. What is it and how do you measure the impact? And how do you distinguish one ESG company from another? So my concern when we were thinking about this was the world is going to come up with an ESG algorithm and ranking system. It's gonna happen. It's going to happen in the equity market. It's going to happen in the bond market. And the reason it's going to happen is the same reason why there are credit ratings in the bond market. Because there's a demand and need for, for the product. People want clarity, transparency, understanding. And everybody wants a third party to step in between. And there's so much money to be made, the forces of capitalism will create it to happen. So if you're Moody's and S&P, you're working on creating an LST mandate of how you're going to measure LST and how people can adopt it. In fact, in the leveraged loan world, so leveraged loans are bank loans issued primarily in private equity or LBOs that the banks don't want to hold in their balance sheet. They want to syndicate to mutual funds, pensions, high net worth individuals, everyone else but their own balance sheet. Um, the LSTA has said, which governs how you trade these things and the rules, they're working on the ESG ranking system. So the money is going to be behind it because it's a business. And we recognize that when that happens, unintended consequences can occur. So for instance, in credit ratings, we think the credit ratings do a great job at the initial time of underwriting when they issue it, but they don't do a great job following it. And they do a terrible job. So we believe that there are inefficiencies that you can make money in the corporate bond market based on credit rating, more so in high yield than investment grade, but equally so. And we actually think there's a whole group of not rated bonds that could be deemed investment grade or higher. So it's going to happen in the ESG world. And a concern we had when we launched the strategy is that the constraints of what is deemed ESG enough may limit your investment opportunities for the sake of ESG as opposed to being mindful. So that's why we use the word responsible investing. It's a mindful approach. And by the way, our system's internal. We think we do a pretty good job. We're constantly looking to refine it. We welcome third parties to develop the system. Um, we hope that we'll always be an ESG fund, but if the ESG requirement becomes so great, 
that you're giving up reasonable returns will just be ESG mindful, right? Because they narrow the universe so much. Um, I think, I don't know what other funds are doing. I th- I've seen very few investment firms that are using an ESG concept that have negative attribution as well as positive attribution. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that let's take Tesla. Now, almost everybody thinks Tesla is ESG mindful and they're great, but, and, and they, they might meet our minimum threshold. They might not. We haven't actually scored up Tesla, but I can tell you one thing where they're going to get a negative attribution. Look, it's got an ingenious CEO, but he is got some governance issues. He's got some, you know, issues, right? The SEC sanction them. You can't say they're perfect and give them only positive attributes without considering that he has some liability or risk as a CEO. So we'd give the CEO, from a governance standpoint, a negative attribution. I mean, Elon Musk is a genius, for sure. We'd also give them a negative attribution because their business was initially based, and we'll see how it goes in the future, on government subsidies, right? That doesn't make it not a great ESG company. I'm not trying to pick one Tesla. I'm trying to pick something that most people in common world consider immediately it's absolutely ESG friendly and where one has to consider the holistic picture. The other thing about Tesla, again, not picky one is, you know, everyone assumes because it's electric cars, it's very green. But if you're in Virginia, West Virginia, you know, charging up your car with electricity, coal fired, I don't know what that carbon footprint impact is. So there's a lot of issues with ESG, which is why we called it responsible. Our system does have negative merits. In fact, one of the positions, uh, we disclose our positions every month. So one of the positions in our portfolio is something called Copper Mountain, which according to Copper Mountain, the Canadian government has named it the most ESG friendly copper mining company. But when we did our underwriting, uh, we decided it, qualified in the portfolio in a 20% basket. So we say 80% has to meet a threshold and 20% has to be uh, some ESG attribute, but isn't meet our threshold. Um, so it's in our 20% card out, but it doesn't actually make it into our 80% completion. So, you know, that's how we're approaching uh, responsible investing. That's how we're approaching ESG. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I was had the privilege of, of mentoring under Joe Steinberg, when I mentioned to Joe that we were doing a responsible credit fund, he said he wanted the irresponsible fund, right? Because sex pays. <laughs> so. Well, there's one holding in that strategy, I think that stood out to me. And that was micro strategy, because depending on who you ask, and I, I swear I could go to both sides of the aisle on this com- one company. And, and I should also preface, I don't know if the debt you're holding is similar to the debt they used to buy Bitcoin. But obviously that's a hot topic for discussion around, especially with ESG involvement. It could either be the most ESG thing you could do as far on the environmental side, depending on who you ask, or the worst thing possible, depending on who you ask. So I'm just curious, that one stood out to me, maybe walk us through uh, that holding in particular um, and maybe just how you approached it in general. Okay, so first of all, we own the micro strategy paper um, in, multiple of our strategies and and products um it's a good question so let me go back to the to our responsible investing strategy which it it does exist um and then i'll also talk about as a credit profile so we there is no information that is readily available from microstrategy on an esg policy i'm sure they have one we haven't really been very successful in getting one that is satisfactory for us to deem it on a scoring factor system to qualify as ESG in our 80% bucket. Remember in our responsible credit fund, we have an 80% bucket, it has to be. We have a 20% sort of, they're not exclusionary, but it doesn't meet our bucket. So the distinction that 20% is it's not gonna be coal, it's not gonna be guns, it's not gonna be people that take advantage of children overseas. It's gonna have your traditional This is exclusionary, we never buy them. So this is things where you could argue there is some ESG benefit, but that it doesn't meet our threshold. So it's in the 20% bucket. That bucket is about 
uh, 14% today of total names. I gave you two of them. Um, but, you know, it's not just about environmental. You know, you mentioned green. It's also about community commitment, social commitment, customers, suppliers. I mean, you can make it without being green. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, some companies, you know, are uh, green focused. They may be more governance focused or social focused. Um, I'm not sure it meets the best governance either, by the way. Um, but it certainly provides a controversial but social attribute, which is the democratization and decentralization of store value something. I mean, I want, I'm avoiding the word currency because to me, currency is something where a, you're required to accept it by legal tender, by the government. So you're not required to accept Bitcoin. Um, we didn't buy it for the Bitcoin. In fact, it's the thing we like the least about this, the company. The company has a very good software uh, tech, tech business. Uh, they issued this debt that is secured by that business. Um, there are debt incurrence tests that prevent them from layering more and more debt on top of us. Uh, it was originally sort of a smaller issue off the run and it became so much in demand, they upsized it pretty dramatically. And they cut the pricing, by the way, that's what they do in this environment because today capital is a commodity. Um, that hopefully will change in the future. Um, but uh, we felt you were getting an outstripped return for a money good credit, meaning we thought the underlying business supported the debt with more cushion underneath than the debt. So there was plenty of residual value, so to speak. And then what we made it interesting was the, bit, the, money, the proceeds were used to buy Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is pledged to this debt. So if Bitcoin's worth zero, the core business covers the debt. And if Bitcoin's worth whatever, it's like a loan to value. We have that collateral that improves our credit profile, which also, by the way, if Bitcoin stays where it is or goes higher, they are likely to eventually refinance. I mean, I'm not sure as a government, and this is why I said from governance, I'm not sure borrowing money to buy Bitcoin uh, is necessarily the smartest governance. I mean, it's particularly interesting that if you look at what we value the business at, and then you look at their spot pricing of their cryptocurrency, I, I'm not sure how the stock valuations are justified, um, but you know, that's, that's a discussion for another day. Last question on that was just around the minimum qualification to even purchase an asset like that. I mean, I imagine that's why people find someone like Crossbridge, FINRA sponsored, well-accredited people to go out there and buy this kind of product. But I'm just curious on the back end side of things, if MicroStrategy, let's say, for example, goes to market with this debt product, where is that listed? What exchange is that on? How do you guys even go about the, the plumbing of just purchasing that? I'm just curious. So uh, whether it's MicroStrategy or it's Carl Icahn's debt, um, IEP, uh, which has nothing to do, there's no way that my Carl Icahn's debt is going to meet the criteria for responsible investing. Um, uh, no offense to Carl, but that's, I think, a foregone conclusion. Um, but in answer to your question, so it would be great if debt was traded on an exchange like stocks. Sometimes, generally not. And also, it's very if you're an investor who can't buy in at least 100,000 face amount lots, but ideally million, you get what we call retail uh, ripoff, meaning the broker dealers charge you a big spread to transact. So hopefully as technology advances and the world becomes more focused on using our technology to create less friction to buy and sell things in corporate debt, uh, or mortgages or asset packs, uh, that will resolve itself. But for now, probably the most efficient way from a transaction cost would be for either people to own ETFs that are passive or to own an actively managed fund. But the way it trades is, quite frankly, the way the stock market used to trade before there was technology, you know, there's a market maker and there's a bid ask spread and they make their money by taking risk or better yet, matching up buyers and sellers. So it's that kind of market. Um, when I started in the business, the phone was how you transacted. 
then it became the phone, you transacted, but you got information via faxes. Then you got information being uh, computer systems such as Bloomberg. In fact, that is the system where brokers put in electronic markets that they are quoting or making. A lot of times it's quoting because they don't really want to take risk. Meaning, well, we're guessing it's here. Give us a, an order and we'll, we'll go out and find out for you. Um, there are some exchange traded. Uh, when we uh, sometimes take a big chunk of a new issue called anchoring, uh, we often try to re request it being listed on an exchange um, because as a mutual fund, we think the more transparency uh, and the more opportunity for people to participate, the greater the markets. Uh, there's this concept that started in the leverage loan market and in the private place market was even before that, which are what they call club deals. They get two or three guys in a room, they chop up the debt, they keep it, and guess what? It never trades. So there's no price volatility. Um, you know, we don't think that is uh, best business practices. Uh, we'd rather see it owned by a lot of people. And if it goes up, we sell it. If it goes down, we can buy more. And if we want liquidity, we get liquidity. If we made a mistake, there's a market. Um, so, you know, there's, when you look at private funds, um, you, you have to consider sort of the, the, the club nature um, of pricing. Uh, so again, and the more, the worse the credit quality perceived, the more uh, bid ask spread and less transparency there is in pricing. So that's the other reason why high yield was interesting was you learn very quickly if you're trading government bonds and you're on the broker dealer side, you're trading for a 64th, maybe a 32nd if you're lucky. If you're trading investment grade bonds, you're trading for a 64th to an eighth. You know, when I started in the business in high yield back in the 80s, you, know, you could trade for I mean, it was unconscionable, but you could trade for four or five points. Today, typical high yield trades at a quarter. Sometimes they ask for a half, sometimes an eighth. Obviously, the lower maturity, shorter duration is tighter. Um, obviously, if it's in the ETF, it might be tighter. Um, but it's a widespread business in a period where you can buy stocks at Robinhood and Schwab for free. <laughs> but it's a hard individual market to participate in. One thing that does trade on exchanges pretty easily are SPACs. And I want to talk about them because you've been investing in SPACs since the mid 2000s. So you have a lot of experience in this area. It's not just a, a hot you know, sector to get into, like for a lot of people. So I'm kind of curious what has driven you now to launch a SPAC ETF? Okay. So um, there are various product cycles and various opportunities within the SPAC product cycle to invest in. Um, I'm going to specifically address your question on uh, why we decided to launch a SPAC ETF and specifically the segment of that product cycle we're looking at. And then you can explore other areas if you want or not. So again, I know you have a very sophisticated audience, but just to get everybody who may not be quite as sophisticated on a level playing field, simplistically, uh, a SPAC is a company that goes public through an IPO process where people give the proceeds of the money to the SPAC, except there's no business. There's nothing. It's, they're, they're, they're selling you a dream or an opportunity for a future business opportunity for your cash. And yeah, they may be focused on a specific segment or industry, but that's what it is. So you, the IPO investor, give them the cash and you get SPAC shares. It may be units, which consist of shares and warrants. It may just be shares. They may split. There's lots of moving pieces. You know, it's, a, it's an arbitrager's dream of the different pieces, but you're going to get ultimately shares. So if you get units and you sell off the warrants, you're getting shares. If you sell off the shares, you're getting warrants. Why is this important? Because what happens to your cash? It gets put in a trust account, held where it holds pretty much T-bills. And that trust account is for the benefit of the shareholders. So it went public, cash that you gave them to go public goes into a trust account with T-bills for your benefit. And now the people that launched the SPAC, the sponsors are looking for a deal, right? You're hoping they find the next Virgin Galactic or DraftKings or something a little bit more arithmetic and cash flow like a Jupiter acquisition or uh, 
when Foley bought Triple C, which was a public company that then became a high yield creditor of private equity that's now becoming public and they're using the proceeds to do that. It's called CCC information. System. Or quantum scape if you're Jeremy Grantham, maybe. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, you as the investor might be thinking about who is my sponsor? Is it a private equity shop, a hedge fund, industry players, you know, people that had big jobs in investment banks, you know, and, I, and am, am, I, am I just like, you know, you make an investment on management, are they going to find a good deal at a good price in a quick period of time? Because a SPAC has a life typically of two years or less. Okay. And because you're getting bells and whistles with your stock, meaning warrants or rights, or even founder shares, by the way, um, you want a good deal because you get, you get a levered or return or better gearing. Now, why does a sponsor do this? All right, let's back up. That's what the investor in the IPO gets. There's various cycles. Why does a, why does a sponsor do this? A sponsor does this because on a $200 million SPAC, you know, there's lawyer fees, there's investment banking fees, there's registration SEC fees, there's putting a team together to go look at an industry and find acquisitions. That costs, let's say, in a $200 million deal, $8 million. So they're going to put up the $8 million of risk money, meaning they don't get any of the money that's sitting in collateral trust. That's the money to get this thing launched, operate, and to find a target. And if they don't find a target successfully, they lose all their money. Whereas you, the SPAC investor, if they don't find a target successfully and it goes to liquidation, remember those that cash is sitting in a trust account in T-bills for your benefit. You get those proceeds. So you are, for simplicity purposes, principal protected. So if a SPAC issues $200 million and they put $200 million in the trust account and it's earning interest, don't forget. That's for your benefit. And sometimes SPACs put in $210 million against $200 million of shares. So there's over collateralization, but the sponsor gets no benefit. They only get a benefit if a deal is consummated, a merger, a business combination. But how do they get rewarded? They effectively get 20% or more of the upside. So like a hedge fund, it's a pretty nice deal, right? Put up 8 million bucks, they get a deal closed. The value of the stock stays at $10 or parity same price you issued it at 200 million, they just got $40 million. 8 million to make 40, if it trades down in half and only goes to $5 a share, you lost a lot of money if you stayed in the deal. They still make money, right? So there's a, a misalignment uh, to some degree because the fees are so egregious for the sponsors, but there's also an alignment that if they get a good deal, you do get to participate. Now, that's a basic spec. There's one other point I need to mention. When they announce a transaction, you, the shareholder, not the warrant holder, not the bells and whistles, you as the shareholder can vote for or against the deal. You vote against the deal, they get to keep looking till liquidation date. And at liquidation date, the only people that get the benefit of the trust are the stockholders, not the warrant holders, not anybody like that. If you vote for the deal and the deal goes forward, you, the shareholder, don't have to agree to be part of the merged company. You can say, I'm voting for the deal because I want my money back. You have the right to redeem for, with the benefit of the trust account. Only your proration, not excess. So if it's 200 million trust and 50% of the people agree to go forward and take the deal, such and like in the deal that just closed recently was Rocket Labs. I think they had 90% or more agree to roll into Rocket Labs, which is a spaceship launching company. But the other 10% or less than 10% said, I want my cash back, right? And they got their cash back. Now, part of the reason for the cash is the targets want the cash, whatever, we can spend time on that. But we launched the fund because historically, if you ignore the period from let's say Labor Day of last year, meaning Labor Day of 2020, to let's say St. Patrick's Day of 2021, other than that, brief period of time, most of the time, in order to induce you to be in, give them the cash while they look for a deal, you had to get paid something on your money, time value of money. However they did it, they had to induce you, whether it was with warrants or over collateralizing the trust that you could then redeem for the over collateralized amount, they had to induce you. 
And most people that buy SPACs as an IPO or in the secondary market are looking more as arbitrageurs. I'm getting a return on my money. And then if you announce a good deal, I get to participate. So think of the SPAC shareholder or unit holder as a convertible bond with a two-year maturity with no coupon, where you're buying it either at 100 par or you're buying it at a discount backed by T-bills. And if they announce a good deal, you get equity upside. And if they don't announce a good deal, you make a return in a yield. Now in a world today where the convertible bond market, half the issues have a zero coupon and are trading at a 35 to 50% premium over the current stock price, it's kind of an attractive asset class. And we looked at, and we've bought SPACs in the past, where we look at it either as, as exactly like that, as a convertible bond opportunity. So in the ETF, we're not quite that focused. In the ETF, what we're saying is, we're going to buy at the IPO or in the secondary market, units and shares at collateral value or to discount the collateral value. Effectively, we're not taking principal risk. And if they liquidate, we'll get our money back. If they go up, we can sell them. If they go down, we can buy more. If they announce a deal, it's a great deal and it goes up above the redemption value, the collateral value, we can sell. If it doesn't go above the redemption value, we'll redeem. So today, to give you an idea, I just want to look at a piece of paper because we just ran it today. Again, this is going to change because this is going to be announced a little bit in the future. But to give you an idea, this has become a huge market and it's become, you know, 10 to 15% of our assets across the board just in this kind of product because it's a cash alternative product, right? You've got two year maturity or less. You're buying at a discount for a almost like commercial paper at a discount. So to give you an idea, um, today there are a total amount of SPACs approximately of 550, 550 SPACs. And the total amount of cash in trust is over $170 billion. Now, if all of them find deals, the typical deal size is about $2 billion, you're going to have 550 new companies entering the small and mid-cap market with a, an enterprise value that exceeds $200 million, $200 billion, because the, that, the SPAC owners typically own a minority interest in the combined entity. Okay. That's a pretty big market. And of that, call it 550 SPACs, about 140 have announced deals. And the rest are looking for deals. And what's interesting is that SPAC market today, if you bought the ones that are looking for deals and announcing deals, and you ran them to their liquidation date, the median is almost 2.5% yield, yield. That means there's a whole bunch yielding more obviously a whole bunch yielding less. Some of the reasons, some are le yielding less because they're a more preferred sponsor like the Gores, or because they have a deal in hand, right? So if you have a deal and you think it's gonna go through, it's gonna close in 90 to 150 days, right? So the liquidation date's longer than that. So that's one way of investing in the stuff that has announced events. And then you're gonna, if the deal goes through, you're gonna redeem. That's great. You make very good short-term returns. Obviously of arbitrage risk that the deal doesn't go through, you now extend to the liquidation date. By the same token, you also have stuff that hasn't announced a deal yet, that if they announce a deal, your maturity is coming up sooner if they close it, which is gonna improve your yield. So we think the asset size is big enough. And we think that if you're disciplined, you can provide people very, very low duration yields in that time frame, And let me be clear, if you read our perspectives, we specifically say we're only buying things, stocks and units at or below collateral value, trust value. So we're not paying a premium. So if the world becomes like February, they may not have so much to buy at the moment. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. Um, and if we also announce that we will dispose of the shares or units within 10 business days post a successful combination or merger. I mean, quite frankly, I don't ever expect or highly unlikely to expect to go beyond the redemption. We'll either sell it or redeem. Why is it 10 days? Well, 
I hope we never make a mistake. Sometimes you do. It gives me a little bit of room not to violate rules for the investor. But our intent is not to roll into the new deal. That's a different decision. That's do I like the deal? What's the company's opportunities? That's a small cap, mid cap decision. And there's huge opportunities, just not what this one's going to do. Well, you're making a lot of sense, David. I was just, it was just occurring to me while you were speaking that there are a lot of similarities with the strategy to something like a venture capital firm. I mean, it seems like if we go back to even one of the earliest points you touched on with the high yield corporate debt portfolio, you're talking about a theme of expected losses. You're expecting some of these things to go to zero. And if you bundle them up into a portfolio of sorts, you really only need a few outliers to do very well for the portfolio itself to do well in aggregate, right? So I'm, I'm thinking if, if I'm understanding this correctly, you're packaging together a lot of different SPACs, some of which might just you know, not find a company and get liquidated. Others might find a unicorn. And you just need a small percentage of that package to outperform to get an overall aggregate good return. Our number one mantra here at our firm is to protect principal first. And the way to make money is not to lose it first. That's what we're good at. Other people are great at making money and taking principal risk, you know, and, and figuring that out. We try not to lose money. We, we do lose money. We try not to. Um, but our mantra is don't lose money, focus on principal. You know, the Warren Buffett, you know, return of principal is, you know, the fundamental basis of analysis of, of investing. So in the SPAC world, if you get a unit, when they, they, a SPAC is typically issued a unit. Typically issued is a stock and a warrant. Eventually, the stock and the warrant split into two separate trading vehicles. So what we're suggesting is we would actually sell the warrant, take that cash, and reduce our cost basis in the purchase price of the stock, right? Because we know if we paid $10 for the stock and there's 10 or more in trust, we're going to get 10 or more liquidation or merger. And if we sell off the warrant, which is all the future upside, we're going to guarantee a return or lock in a return, I guess is a better way of saying it, you know, at three or 4%. And if it's a good deal, it's going to trade up anyway, and we're just going to make less. In the warrants, you are correct. There's a whole group of SPAC investors, and your value investors may be interested in this, that actually look at and say, if I buy the IPO unit, and I sell off the stock, and I keep the warrant, I'm creating cheap, long-term call options of about five years, right? And if I have a portfolio of them, yes, if they liquidate, they're worth zero. If the deal's no good and trades below 1150, they're worth zero. But I only need a couple to do really well, and I make a return. And like every venture capital portfolio, having a portfolio of a lot of them is likely to give you the outcome you want. I do want to warn people two things about the warrants that are very important. If a SPAC announces a deal within the first 12 months of going public, the warrants are European style, meaning you can't exercise those warrants until that 12 month period is gone. So they don't price uh, like a normal call option that you and I would be familiar with. So, and actually you can, a lot of times you can wait to see the deal is and pick up the back half. I mean, yes, it, your warrants likely to double before you figure that out. You lost the first hundred percent move but you can evaluate the situation and that may be a better way of doing it. it. may not, that's a strategy. The other thing is a lot of warrants, the company has the right to force you to redeem or convert um, when it goes up to 1850. It doesn't mean you're not purchasing the upside, but again, it creates another technical trading aspect to it. Um, I, I, I think it's perfectly fine to own a portfolio of warrants. I'm not a venture capital investor. I don't invest in things where if you win the litigation, you make a lot of money. If you lose it, you get wiped out. It's, it's just not what our discipline is, but it's certainly a legitimate strategy. So I wanna clarify what you're suggesting. I'm not suggesting anything other than it's a very perfectly fine investment strategy for people that want to do that and they understand the risks. For us, it's not what we do and what we offer. I appreciate that distinction. If I'm oversimplifying further, the whole idea of a SPACs, as you just described to me, sounds a lot like, going out and finding a great jockey who's then going to go find a great horse. It's just a really oversimplification. And you mentioned 550 SPACs out there, meaning 550 sponsors. So that sounds like a lot of due diligence as far as going out there and saying, who is the sponsor we want to back? 
or who do we believe in? So walk us through a little bit how you approach evaluating sponsors and how many of them are going to make up the ETF. Got it. So first of all, 550 SPACs will not necessarily mean 550 sponsors because many sponsors have SPAC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that lowers your number of sponsors, but that doesn't change the question. Um, so I'd like to tell you that doing really good due diligence of the sponsor is going to give you a significantly better outcome. And unfortunately, I don't think that's been the experience. There are a couple sponsors that are definitely more successful. Foley, Gores, Betsy Cohen, right? Mudrick, although he just had a SPAC that didn't work out. But you can sort of determine that. But there has been sponsors we had high hopes for based on their history and their experience. And the deal was just okay. Um, there's been people that most people haven't heard of and the deal's been phenomenal. So I'd like to tell you, and we, we, the way you do the due diligence is there's something called testing the waters and capital markets groups call up large institutions that can write big checks such as ourselves and says, hey, would you like a testing the water call? You meet management. You get to talk to them. They can't really tell you any of their targets, but it's more, let me tell you all about how terrific I am and why this space makes sense. But, you know, also is some of it's sector selection. And that's actually a bigger point. There's over 50 SPACs focused on fintech. I don't think there's 50 fintech good deals at a reasonable price. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. So sector plays a role as well. I actually think sector is a bigger situation, but at the end of the day, both sector and sponsor, if you're doing it the way our ETF that we're proposing is doing it, it's a random walk. So in fact, it's such a random walk that someone could buy our ETF or another ETF that's doing it themselves, you know, that's competing with us uh, when ours launch. Or quite frankly, you can do it yourself and you can trade for free at Schwab and Robinhood so you don't have to pay our management fee and our expense ratios for running the fund. And in fact, if you're interested, there's a lot of companies that provide databases of all the SPACs outstanding and what their terms are, where they trade. But a lot of them, or, or at least all the ones I've realized, make you pay for the information. Now here's the situation. It's all public information. It's all filed with the SEC, but it's so much information and it's a work. So that what you're really paying for is someone to aggregate the information for you in a way that you as an individual can work. And quite frankly, you know, I think, and our hope is in the middle of September, we're going to be able to give you a basic database for free. If you, if you go to spacobserver.com in the middle of September, spacobserver.com, all one word, and you put in your email, you know, we're going to provide you the database for free. It'll be basic, but it'll give you how much is in trust, what the last price was, what that gross spread is, what your yield to liquidation is. Is it currently have a deal? And if so, what is that deal? Does it not have a deal? And who are the sponsors and what's the sector? What are the symbols? Now that's pretty basic information, but if you have that information, you can replicate exactly what our ETF is gonna do and what competitor ETFs are gonna do in the pre-merger SPACs. We're really focused on buying things at or below collateral value and then either letting them to go to liquidation or redeeming them out, right, as a yield product. So as much as I'd like people to buy our product or other ETFs, you know, you'll automatically have a better performance, most likely, if you just do a diversified portfolio and do it yourself. And by the way, it sounds counterintuitive that we would focus on trying to provide that information to people for free. But again, I believe investors are entitled to transparency and they have to make a decision. Do they want to do it themselves or do they want to pay somebody? Are our results going to be better? Hopefully, but who knows? It'll be an interesting test. You mentioned the expense ratio. Now I'm curious, what does the expense ratio look like for the ETF? And is it net of all the underlying assets in it? So the expense ratio is the audit, the tax preparation, the striking of the price NAV every night, the work involved in monitoring, the, you know, creating the portfolio, doing the accounting portfolio, custodian, and custodian has costs. And of course, not insignificant is our management fee because I wanna get paid for the work I'm doing. So in our uh, SPAC ETF, I don't think we put in the registration statement, but we're gonna propose an 80 basis points expense cap, which means, the investor will pay 80 basis points off the top 
to both pay us and all those other expenses. We're not all the base points. And, you know, if we, if the SPAC's assets, the AUM grows, or the ETF assets grow, that expense ratio will come down because, you know, custodian is relatively variable, but administrative costs, board of director costs, all that stuff's fixed. So you're going to bring down your cost. Um, ultimately, if interest rates remain low and the returns that we produce under the strategy aren't two and a half to 8%, but they're one to 3% net, then obviously maybe we have to reduce our fee to help improve the expense cap. We've done that before. In some of our other mutual funds, we've actually re reduced the expense cap and earned less in order to make the product more reasonable for the work we're doing for the underlying investor. It's not something, quite frankly, I'm that interested in doing, um, but if it's necessary, I will. And how many SPACs do you expect to make up the ETF? Is it typically around like 40 holdings or so, uh, but is it going to exceed that? It depends on the market, right? If there's 500 SPACs and, you know, what's the liquidity, what's the size and what are the yields? You know, to own a SPAC at a mediocre yield doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, today we have over 150 SPACs in the assets we're managing. So, I mean, when we start the ETF, probably not because it's going to start with very little assets. But as the assets grow, you know, by definition, you'll, you'll grow your SPAC number. The other issue is um, owning more than 9.9% of a SPAC has, has issues regarding 13Ds, 13Gs. Um, uh, owning 19.9% has serious issues because it involves, you know, ownership control issues. So if the SPAC assets grow, that obviously will, by definition make you want to expand. And also there's a liquidity aspect. I mean, if it's a $200 million SPAC, you know, you can own 5 million of it, but you can't own 40 million and have liquidity, right? So those are the issues. So quite frankly, the SPAC market's big enough today um, but one of the issues we actually have thought about, all of, our, all of our strategies are capacity constrained. And I believe every strategy out there, whether it's equities or whatever, has a capacity limit, both on the manager and the actual asset class. One of the things we explored when we launched this ETF is based on today's market, and if the market deteriorates to a more normal market like what it was a year or two ago, how big can our SPAC grow? And is there a way that we could capacity constrain? We've, we've come up with a solution for that, we think. So we're going to be very mindful, using the same words as the ESG fund, of not growing assets for the sake of growing revenue. Fantastic. Well, David, this is very compelling. I mean, it's a whole new perspective on this asset class for probably a lot of our listeners, but myself included. I feel like I could talk to you all day, but I want to be mindful of your time. I, I've, I have a lot more questions, but I think this is a great place to wrap. Let, before I let you go, Definitely provide our audience the resources available to them and where they can learn more about Crossing Bridge and yourself. Okay, so first of all, thanks for the opportunity. And you know, if you get a readership that has a specific area that they want us to go back and focus on, and we get invited back, we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, I thank your reader, your audience today, uh, whatever day it is for them that they're listening or seeing. Um, I know this is lengthy and their time's valuable. Uh, if you want to learn more information about our firm specifically, it's Crossing Bridge. It's all one word, pretty simple. Just go to www.crossingbridgeadvisors.com or just type in the word Crossing Bridge. Um, you can also look up our symbols, mutual fund symbols. We have uh, three mutual funds. Again, I'm going to be cognizant of the FINRA rules, um, but we have a low duration strategy, a Crossing Bridge focused low duration strategy. We have a responsible investing strategy. Again, a crossing bridge responsible investing strategy. I think if you use these words, you'll find us on Morningstar. We have an ultra short duration strategy. Again, crossing bridge ultra short strategy. And then of course, hopefully in September, we'll be launching the, uh, the crossing bridge uh, SPAC ETF, which will have the symbol SPC is what we've reserved, San Peter Charlie. Um, the other thing is uh, look for the middle of September, end of September, uh, SPAC, S-P-A-C, observer.com. You know, it's not going to be a super sophisticated site. We're throwing it together pretty quickly. We have a lot that we would hope to launch uh, uh, an affiliate of ours for more information. But we, we really want you to be able to get data in an aggregated way so you can do this yourself or you at least have knowledge. Um, that'll be a way. Um, people can always email me, uh, D Sherman, uh, D for David, Sherman, S-H-E-R-M-A-N, 
at crossingbridge.com. Um, our parent company is Kohansic. Uh, you can also email me at david at kohansic.com, C-O-H-A-N-Z-I-C-K.com. Um, I'm sure they can reach out to you and you can find me and, and steer them toward me. Um, so those are all the ways of doing it. Uh, I'm not going to get my phone number out. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask for that, but I will. I would love to have you back on the show. This was just such a pleasure and a really fun conversation. And so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 